explain, uh, just be able to stand up and explain what their answer was going to be and the reasoning for their answer. All right, so we have three email scenarios. Uh, what I'll do is I will ask which one of the groups who had email scenario number one. Could I get one of those groups to volunteer? Email scenario number one. You got enough? <laughs> you got a number one over here? All right, so I'll, because it's the first time we're hearing it, I'll ask you to read the email scenario for us, so for everyone, and then tell us what you would have responded to this question. Well, this person asked four questions, all different. Dear division director, during a division level contest, the counters collected the ballots from the judges and proceeded to the counting room. One of the judges realized he made a mistake on his ballot. He wrote the second place contestant's name incorrectly. He also forgot to sign his ballot. He left the contest room, found the counters, and wanted to correct his ballot sheet. Questions. One, is it correct to discard this ballot sheet because it was not signed when it was collected? Or is a judge allowed to sign the ballot sheet after it's been collected? Two. Should the ballot be discarded because the second place contestant's name was spelled incorrectly? Three, since only the second place contestant's name was wrong, can points still be given to the first and third place contestants on the ballot? Four, could a judge be allowed to change anything after the ballots have been collected by the counters? Our response to number one, understanding that on page 11K, it says that the ballots must be signed. And so we would say that it is invalid and would be discarded, that ballot sheet. In number two, if the second place contestant's name was spelled incorrectly, but it was still obvious that it was maybe just something, a small error, then that would still be proper. That, that would be seen as being the right person. Uh, the third one, we believe the points would be given to first, second, and third, just because the person's name spelled a little correctly should not eliminate them from being in second place. And no, they cannot change anything after the ballots have been collected by the counters. All right. So I have a couple of other groups from number one. Do they have any thoughts or different thoughts? Lisa? So we were challenged by the fact that we couldn't find anything in the rule book that said that the judges were not allowed to go into the counting area or leave the speech area. It may be in there, but we couldn't see that. So we couldn't find a rule specifically denying the judge the opportunity to change the ballot once it was collected. Right. Right. And I, I will agree that there is nothing explicitly stating that that I have seen either. And that is what makes this an interesting question. And this is the issue. These are the questions you're going to get. You're going to get a question that, if it's a, no, it just says right here, and you had it, you know, that, those are going to be these questions. You're often going to get questions that fall in the cracks of, well, wait a second, it doesn't quite say you can't do that. Uh, but at the same time, if you read, sometimes you have to interpret based on what other rules are saying. And I'll, I'll get to an example of that uh, in a little bit. So that was, anybody else had number one? Any other? Yeah, over here, yeah. Did you have uh, different answers, different thoughts on that? Not so far. Not so far. So you agreed with the yeah. statements made that one uh, after if it's not signed, it's disqualified uh, ballot. It's a ru ruined ballot and isn't used. Two, spelling isn't important unless you can. I'm going to say a qualifier unless you can't distinguish it between two different contestants. Yeah. Yeah, if, it, it, if, if they've spelled it so badly that you and I, well, I don't know if they mean this contestant or that contestant, yeah. at that point, I would argue is a ruined a ruin ballot. Uh, number three was, uh, do you still count the other? Well, because all of the points. misspelling, sh if it's not sure. bad enough that you know, you, you definitely know who you would, you would count all three. If it's a ruined ballot, it's ruined for everybody. And then the last one is, should they be able to change anything after they collect it? Well, at some point, they should not be able to change it. We all agree. On that, at some point, you're like, no, sorry, too late. You cannot change anything on this. Really, it's about when is that point. And I would argue that after it's left their hands and entered someone else's hands, mm -hmm. that is the most cleanest point, at which point you can say it can't be done. Because between the ballot collector collecting it and the judge coming up, you don't know who that judge has talked to. You don't know what that judge has seen or said, uh, or who may have influenced him in that moment, right? So. The cleanest point to say, no, the cutoff is this, is once it's collected. 
We did discuss the fact that sometimes when the ballot counter collects the ballot, if, the, if they just kind of hand it to them and they notice that it wasn't signed, they might give it back to them right away and say, sign it, before they actually take it out of the room. But we're all maybe, human. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're all human. Some and it's you've eliminated fun. the possibility that the judge was influenced by anybody yeah. in that brief second right there. I, 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 I you know, we're a human, it's and I, 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 I wouldn't turn a blind eye to that for sure. I, I don't consider signing it as a change. Because you don't really just you just signed it. You didn't really change the this is my interpretation of signing it. It's change is to change the order, give it different but like, but to sign it is different. I, I appreciate that. Uh, okay. however let's assume that you don't know who the judge is, you don't know if that is the right judge. Uh, like there's there's possibilities there. You, you, you a different ballot calendar has it, it's now in someone else's hands. So I think the cleanest point uh, to yeah. say this is the cutoff is that yeah. because it's very clear to everybody when that happened. Only one exception, the tie-breaking judge. Mm -hmm. so, How about that? Uh, so when the chief judge gets the tie-breaking judge, they have to make sure that they yeah. rank first, yeah. second, and third, and it must be signed. If chief judge opens it and not all the criteria is there, you need to go back to the uh, tie-breaking judge. Now. I call Toastmasters International. Oh, okay. I was gonna say that logically that kind of makes sense to me, but I know there's nothing in the rules that state no. that. And so you have actually sent to Toastmasters International, and they yeah. they came back and said yes. In that case, the chief judge should go back to the tie-breaking judge and say you need to complete this because we can't differentiate, we can't break the tie without. If there's a tie break, yeah. It That's interesting. Okay. So and it happened something similar with uh, the chief judge that don't write his name. The, 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 the ballot was complete, just the name of the chief judge we need to complete. Mm -hmm. So there's one, there's one, uh, and so the, so you're on the chief judge the for the tiebreaker, uh, for the tiebreaker, oh, yeah. for the tiebreaker so, judge, the, judge, the chief judge go to see the tiebreaker and ask for the, the signature. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very similar. All right, any other questions on those? All right, let's go on to number two. Who has a number two? So go ahead. Yes, number two. Dear area director, I saw a speech this morning that was almost a word-by-word -word story that is posted on the internet. Of the seven-minute speech, five minutes were the story, including the conclusion portion of the speech. The gentleman won. <laughs> Protest rule read as follows. Point seven, protest and disqualification on page uh, 11. I'm not sure. Um, a protest concerning eligibility and originality are limited to judge and contestant. Any protest shall be lodged with the chief judge and or contest chair prior to the announcement of the winning and alternates. Before a contestant can be disqualified on the basis of originality, the contestant must be given an opportunity to respond to the judges. A majority of the judges must concur in the decision to disqualify. The contest chair can disqualify a contestant on the basis of eligibility. All decisions of the judge are qualifying judge are, and qualifying judges are final. Are final sorry. Final. Uh, while there is a guideline for the specific contest, which took place at the area level, what about this individual moving forward? Can he be disqualified because his speech was not original? And then we, we find on page 13, at the top, number four, after announcement, of contestant winner is final unless the list of winner is announced incorrectly. In which case, the chief judge, ballot counter of timers are permitted to immediately interrupt to correct the error. But it is final, so we have to accept that he is the winner. The second portion of that because in the question it is implicit that can he go to the next level? Can he? We assume he, he want to present the same speech. The question will be then on page eight for speech subject and preparation. 
subsection D.2. Before all contests, every contestant must certify in writing to the ch chief judge that the content of their speech is or will be substantially original by using the speaker's certification of eligibility and originality. And then we will ask judge, verify if it is available. Because if the person present at the next level with a different speech, yeah, it would not it. apply. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Who else had two? We had two. And do you have anything to add or no, differences? Same. Same. To the same conclusion. All right. So yeah, once same. once this once the results have been announced, they are final. <laughs> yes, it is. And as you say, the person at the next level could give a different speech. Mm -hmm. Now let me ask this clear, just a sort of clarifying here. Who can protest a speech? A judge. Contestants. Contestants and? Judge. judge. Which judge? All oh, voted. Jeez. No, and I'll say it's not. Sorry, and let me clarify. What do you mean by all judges? All judges of the contest. Except for Could contest for a? Chief judge? No. Not chief judge. All judges, but they contest to who? To the chief judge yeah. or to the chairperson. And tiebreaker? No. no. That's tiebreaker, no. That's correct. It's it's we clearly we specifies judges. voting judges. Voting judges. Voting judges may raise a protest. And if you read other sections in the book, like um, uh, under eligibility, uh, section eight, uh, sorry, uh, section B, to be a chief judge, voting judge, or tiebreaking judge, you must meet the following eligibility. They differentiate between voting judges and tiebreaking judges throughout the book. So when they say only voting judges, that is not tiebreaker, that is not chief judge. Mm -hmm. All right, excellent. And we have number three. Who has a number three? All right, Paul. Okay. Dear division director, what I'm about to say is said without prejudice. I have never met or heard of your division's international speech contest winner until I competed against him last Saturday. After the contest, someone told me the winner was not the average Toastmaster amateur. I subsequently found his website and learned that he is a professional speaker. He's a member of a professional speakers association. He has his own website, sells his own CDs and books, and charges $5,000 for keynote speeches. In short, the other six amateurs were competing with a professional, competing with a professional, someone who makes a living from inspirational speeches and entertainment. The other contestants stood about as much chance of winning as if I played, a te uh, played tennis against a professional tennis player. <laughs> Certainly, the experience of competing in itself is of great value, but I don't think the level playing field is uh, I, but I think a level playing field is needed for fairness. I believe this matter should be addressed. So according to eligibility, I think it's uh, part A, part number one, a uh, member needs to be paid of a club, um, needs to be a paid member of a club in good standing. And for the international speech contest, they must have done two pass or six speeches in the CC. Now, with respect to this person who's experienced and the amateurs, so to speak, I would suggest to them that uh, it's time maybe you can challenge yourself and put that extra effort to up your game to compete against this person. And uh, so that we would uh, want to talk about that. Okay. And the other option I would uh, that we talked about that could be done potentially would, if uh, not for the international speech contest, but for any contests that limit at the district, if they won that speech consistently year after year after year, we could quietly say, maybe you'd like not to compete with this year. So I'll add to that. There's certainly nothing we could do 
and should do to, to, to officially to stop them. Right? There's no reason they can't compete. There's no rules or eligibility. We're certainly not allowed to add new eligibility requirements, uh, such as, sorry, you cannot compete if you've competed, if you've won it for the last 10 years. Uh, we are not permitted to do that. Likewise, we're not permitted to, for example, if we have a paid for contest where people have to pay to come in and see the contest and we raise money, we can't charge the contestants mm -hmm. because that is a new eligibility requirement to compete. They had to pay to get there. You can't add an eligibility requirement. Mm -hmm. So I do agree, absolutely, uh, we certainly can't add that, but in this particular place, there's nothing that prevents that individual, as professional though they may be, from competing in the contest. So if you guys also had, number, do you have anything to add? Any other thoughts on that? I did have a thought on the fact that uh, section 284 says there's like a specific ineligibility list and if they wanted to exclude professional speakers, they wouldn't have been listed in that in the list. So there is, there is specifically something that says these people are ineligible. Right, so it, Toastmasters has created a explicit list and it's not listed that a professional speaker cannot speak, so there's no reason why they couldn't. Margaret. Uh, my question is, because they want somebody that has done at least six speeches in the CC, perhaps they are a new member they're in pathways. Is there a pathway level yes, there minimum? Is. So there is a pathways level. You need to have reached level two of pathways. Now, interestingly enough, last night at 9.30 uh, or 9 o'clock when I posted this, the this uh, version of the rule book is the one that was up there. This morning, they have the new 2019-2020 rule, along with quite a large number of clarifications. Apparently, the, this current book says you must have two levels in pathways, which people interpreted to be, I have level one in path A and I have level one in path B. And that is two levels, so I can compete. So they have clarified that. No, you must have a level two in pathways. They even go so far as to say in the same path, although you, I'm not sure how you could do that with not in the same path. So a lot of clarifications. Anyways, if you do go to the link, it now has the new rule book along with all the clarifications there. It is on there as of this morning. Yeah, that is correct. Perfect. Any other thoughts on that scenario? Yes, scenario number three. Uh, just one more, one more thought. Is there not something about the international speech contest? If you win, yes, you can compete again. That is correct. Uh, one of the exclusions explicitly stated on who's ineligible to compete in the international speech is someone who has won the world championship of public speaking. Then they can win more they, on international speech. That is, that is correct. All right, so I'm at the end of my time. Uh, just a quick review of everything we talked about today. We talked about the six types of contest speeches. We talked about your responsibility as area directors and division directors with regards to both giving a contest speech and being a resource for your clubs. We talked a little bit about planning. We saw the checklists that are available in that. Uh, we saw the training video that's online. I do recommend if you haven't done a contest speech to check that out. And we talked a little bit about rules and rule interpretation, which can be interesting. But as we heard from Randy, you can go back to Toastmasters International and seek clarity. In that section on sp speech contests, they also have a fact, which also clarifies a number of other items in there as well. Definitely read the fact if you have any questions. So I'm gonna turn it back over. If you have contest questions uh, before we leave today that weren't answered or didn't come up, Feel free to grab me in the back. If not, you can always email me at contest at tmd61.com. Tony, that, the new website looks fantastic. Can we give a quick shout out to anybody who had a hand in that? It looks awesome. So I will point to Tanya right now to identify those individuals involved with the new website. <laughs> Tanya, who's here? 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 Who was involved in the new website? Danielle Rindo did all of the French. Uh, Craig uh, kind of mentored through the resource section, and uh, Norm Hart was a huge contributor, and Simon Parcher. There we go. So a big clap. Yeah. Yeah. So we got a five-minute break.